Welcome to Faith, Reason, and Geekdom. I'm your genuflexer, Roger. Join me as we work out these three perspectives in our culture. That's what I call Christian genuflexing. Thank you guys, this is part two of the Iliad. What an episode, hope you guys enjoyed the last one. This one, we're going to get into this one. This is about the gods more in depth. We're going to end this podcast with the final scene, the final stages. But they, I just wanted to say, there is so much stuff we could have got into. We could have done like four, five episodes alone on this book this is one of the literary giants of all time i mean this is part of the western canon so much stuff that i left out so much stuff that i didn't get to do but let's go ahead and get in right into it because it's going to be a lot of good stuff hope you guys are ready hope you guys are buckled up ready to join me in this part two of the iliad now the gods the gods they use a lot of anthropomorphic language in these books. Now, monotheism from the Greek manos meaning only and theos mean God is a word for a belief in one supreme God, the creator, you know, the all powerful, the all wise and all good, the rewarder of good and the punisher of all evil doers, the source of protection. Christians, we are monotheistic. You know, some some would claim that we're not, you know, you have certain Certain religions that would say no, because the reason why is because we have three divine persons distinct from one another, equal in all things. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In essence, a trinity of persons in the one, undivided Godhead, the Trinity. That's what we Christians believe. That's what we profess. That's our profession. We say it in the creed. Monotheism is the opposite, a belief in more than one God or gods, you know, the belief in worship of many gods, you know, religions such as the the uh, Assyrians, Babylonians, Babylonians, Hindus and other ancient religions of Egypt, Greeks and even the Romans and many other ones. And the Trinity is not multiple gods. You know, some people might think that that it is multiple God. No, it's three distinct one God. The Iliad, this is a polytheistic culture. They subscribe to polytheism with all their gods, the Zeus, the Hades, the, uh, you know, Aphrodite, all of this. They're going to Apollo. That You're going to see the difference of that. We've already seen the difference in the story as, as we're going on, as we're moving through the books of the Iliad. We, we definitely see that. Now, in the Iliad, the gods reinforce the themes in the human stories. Kind of like, you know, the, the Agamemnon and Achilles choral, you can see that parallel with the gods like Zeus and Poseidon, their choral. They have a choral. So, I mean, that would be pretty cool. Imagine Zeus and Poseidon going at it, you know, so that's kind of a cool imagery, image of that. I always, uh, I always see of, if you guys seen the Clash of the Titans, Liam Nielsen, when I think of Zeus, I think of Liam Nielsen. You know, that's what I think of. I, I like that movie. You know, there's some problems with it. It's it's it, it's not the best, but I, I kind of enjoyed it, especially uh, Liam Nielsen's portrayal of Zeus with his like feathered hair and his his shiny armor. I just imagine him coming out and be like, I have a special set of skills, you know. So I imagine Zeus doing that. Poseidon, you know, I, I could imagine some. I, I imagine Mickey Rourke for some reason, especially if you guys seen um, the movie. What is it called? Uh, oh, Mortals. If you guys seen Immortals? He's in there. He's he's not playing Poseidon, but he's playing uh, like a like a uh, the antagonist of the movie that Henry Cavill, which is in. Actually, I like that movie. That's good. But but I imagine Mickey Rourke as Poseidon. So when I'm reading this story, I imagine the choral paralleling, you know, with with Liam Nielsen and Mickey Rourke, as you will, and in this choral. But remember, the gods in the Iliad, in the Greek culture, they're also like personified forces of nature's. Okay, that's what kind of they represent in in these poems, these these epics. 
you know, the gods are not good. You know, they're not just, they're not all knowing, they're, they're not all powerful and they are not transcended. You know, they are not, these gods, they are not outside of space and time. You have to remember that. There's no real love for humans compared to the Judeo-Christian ideas. They get distracted very easily, as you'll see. You know, our God of Christianity is omnipotent, omnipotent, omnibelevolent, and omnipresent, and is existence itself outside of space and time. The Greek gods are very anthropomorphic. You know, they share human emotions and their even their likeness. You know, they're bigger, they're stronger, they're powerful, but they're very much like humans, very, very much. The fight they fight with each other like all the time. They're like, they, I mean, I have four kids, so imagine like, oh, dad, dad, he, uh, dad, dada, dada. He, uh, he's looking at me. He's looking at me. He, he doesn't stop talking. Uh, um, dad, dad, uh, my sister, she doesn't stop breathing. She breathed on me. You know, they're, they're, they're quarreling like little children. You know, they fight with each other. Obviously, they, they have sex with each other. They whine. They're like very, very whiny. They're very shallow and they're easily distracted. Um, like when Zeus is, is seduced by uh, Hera with, with the help from uh, Aphrodite, you know, the help uh, to kind of distract him. And that links to the lust. That part when when Zeus is seduced by Hera through through the lust and the sexual nature that kind of links to Paris and and Helen they cannot be killed or harmed and they cannot show courage or valor because they cannot be again killed or harmed. Unlike the warriors, unlike the Achaeans, the Greeks, they're very much the opposite of that. Moira. Uh, which could be translated as a a portion or a share, a share of human life. Moira, sorry. (laughs) The gods do know that humans, gods do know a human's Moira, but it is a debate on whether they can change Moira. They are bound by the rules of the universe. So they know when somebody's going to die. They know the length. They know the time. They know when the fate of the warriors are going to die, they're Moira. They know the human share of life. But there's a debate on whether they can change it or not. Like Zeus tries to save his son, his son who, who, who's going to be killed in battle. And he, he debates on that. But ultimately, they kind of, uh, whether they're forced or they have these kind of like unwritten rules, they are bound by rules. And they're, they're definitely bound by the universe for sure. So, you know, in book 11 to 18, it's a very long process, very long battle. It's called the longest day. It's been called the longest day. This is a very epic battle. You're going to see the movie pro- progressing going along. So, so ordered by Zeus, you know, Hector is to wait to fight until Agamemnon is wounded in battle. And that's when Hector uh, is going to strike and have his great glory Paris is also in the battle. Paris gets in the mix. Remember Paris, you know, got embarrassed by Menelaus, you know, got just embarrassed, got whiffed away by the goddess, saved off, you know, carried off back to the palace, back to his bedroom. And and his older brother kind of scolds him, Hector, you know, the brave older brother, Hector. So but but now Paris is is, he's kind of he kind of he's been shamed. You could say his man card has been taken away or whatever, you know, so. He uses his bow and as he uses it very well, very, very Robin Hood like, very, very good, very accurate. You could like a Hawkeye, I guess you can imagine like the Marvel's Hawkeye using his bow very well, you know, wounds and, and kills a bunch of different Greeks, Achaeans. You know, Odysseus, the great Odysseus, the cleverest, the, the most, you know, he has the best rhetoric of the Greeks. Odysseus, the hero of the Odyssey, is wounded. He gets wounded in his battle. It shows that the Greeks are very vulnerable without Achilles. Agamemnon gets hurt. You had a bunch of people getting hurt and killed. They're vulnerable. They need, they need swift-footed Achilles. They need him. Finally, Hector, I mean, the battle's going back and forth. You got Greeks getting the upper hand and then the Trojans getting the upper hand back and forth. But ultimately, the Trojans are, are gi- giving it to them. You know, they're just, they're giving it to them. Hector breaches the Greeks' gates, you know, where they're back at their camps, their shores near the shore, you know. He breaches it, so with, with of course, with the gods' help. And, and the gods help their own. They go back and forth. You know, Poseidon is hidden as, as Clacus and rallies the Greeks and Zeus as Zeus sleeps when he's, you know, seduced. 
when he's seduced and tricked and you know gets distracted so in book 15 uh zeus awakens and then once he awakens he give he sees what's going on and gets really pissed he i mean he's pissed off He's a pissed off guy. Imagine like Thor when he's mad in, in, in Avengers, the Infinity War comes back. You know, he's like, bring me Thanos. You know, it's kind of like that. So he's like, he wakes up and he finally gives gives Hector his strength back. He gives the Trojans the upper hand and Hector has his strength. You really got to take a step back and you got to really love the Homeric epics. You got to love the epithets in that. Hector of the Glancing Helmet. Swift-footed Achilles, gentle Patrolicus. Patrolicus, his best friend, Achilles' dearest friend. But that's that's one of his. They call him gentle, gentle Patrolicus. You know, he's very like that. But I, I, again, I love the apathets. I mean, you could just think about. Imagine me. I'd be like um, uh, chiseled jaw Roger or or bulging biceps Roger. You don't want to be called somebody be like you don't want to be called like like a uh, noodle arms John. You know what I mean? Nobody. What what is it? Goofy George or something like that? Clumsy uh, Kevin? No no no. <laughs> Imagine apathets like that given to you uh, if we were all in the the palm. No, you want something like like devilishly handsome Roger stuff like that. So Achilles' dearest friend, you know, begs to use his armor. And and let, let me just say that Achilles' armor has been known to be beautiful. Just beautiful and glorious. Very well known. So he begs to use his armor in book 16. And Achilles is like, uh-uh, nah-uh, you ain't going to use that, uh-uh. But finally, no, you know what? He gives in. Achilles gives in and lets him borrow his armor because he wants to think that the, he wants the Greeks to think that it is Achilles. He wants, that, that's what Petrolicus wants. He wants people to think that he is Achilles and it will rile them up. It will give them courage and give them strength. Give them like a pep talk. Imagine like a pep talk. That's the greatest pep talk. That's kind of like a Al Pacino in any given Sunday. Given that, that pep talk, you know. Inches. It's all about the inches. You got to crawl. Ha! Ah. I don't know. That's something like that. But, but anyway, he agrees and says that be careful though. He's like, hey, slow, slow, slow your row. Careful because Apollo is protecting the Trojans. He's protecting the Trojans, and he says, all right, pull my armor on, give them the upper hand, little pep talk, whatever. But do not, I repeat, do not chase the Trojans to Troy. Don't, don't do it. Don't. He warned him, don't do it. Uh, but of course, uh, obviously, he doesn't listen. You know. He doesn't listen. So he fights a glorious battle. I mean, he's, he's he's in there. He's slicing and dicing. I'm talking about heads chopped off. I'm talking about spears being thrown. I'm talking about punches. I'm talking about blood. I'm talking about he's taking on five, four guys. I mean, he, he just, he, he's just, he's giving it to him. They think he's Achilles. They think this guy is Achilles. You know, he's back. He's back. Finally, the boys are back in town. So he fights glorious. He even kills Zeus's son, Zepetron. Or I'm, I'm pr- probably pronouncing it, but yeah, he even kills Zeus's son. And Zeus, of course, that's when he kind of debates if he should do something. Um, but ultimately, no, he uh, Zeus weeps for his dead son who, who is killed by him. So he's trying to scale the wall. He's getting a big head. He's getting he's thinking he's, you know, the top guy. He's trying to scale the wall and Troy's wall. That's when uh, he fails. He fails. He tries again. He fails to scale the wall, fails again. But finally, he is killed by Hector with the help of Apollo, of course. (sighs) You know, they have to intervene. They got to help out their people. But before he dies, uh, he prophesies Hector's death. He prophesies to him. And usually in Greek culture, uh, dying prophecies are to be believed. That's what they believe, the Greeks, that if a man is dying and he prophesies to you, you better listen. You know, St. Paul does not confine this meaning to predictions of the future events. Uh, but he also includes under uh, divine inspirations concerning what is secret, whether future or not, doesn't matter. But in a strict sense, in the proper sense, namely, you know, the revelation of future events. That's what we're going to talk about. But prophecy consists in knowledge and manifestation of what is known. You know, the, mon- the knowledge must be supernatural infused by God. And that's what I'm talking about Christians in particular. That's why St. Paul talks about it must be supernatural and inf- infused by our Lord. Uh, interesting, St. Thomas Aquinas says that there are three kinds of prophecy. Denunciation, foreknowledge, and predestination. 
the great St. Thomas Aquinas, who I love. Um, I'm what you could call, I guess, a peeping Thomas, you know. The gift of private uh, prophecy does exist in our church. It is clear from Scripture and in the acts of many of these saints. But what credence can we give to these private prophecies? You know, you can't just believe little rules or certain guidelines. Pope Benedict XIV says, quote, Human actions are of two kinds, one of which relates to public duties and especially to ecclesiastical affairs, such as preaching, celebrating mass, pronouncing judicial decisions, and the like. With respect to these questions, it is settled in the canon law, where it is to said that no credence is to be publicly given to him who says he has privately received a mission from God, unless he confirms it by a miracle or a special testimony of Holy Scripture. The other class of human actions consist of those of private persons, and speaking of these, he distinguishes between a prophet who enjoins or advises them according to the universal law of the church and a prophet who does the same without reference to those law. In the first case, every man may abound in his own sense whether or not to direct his actions according to the will of the prophet. In the second case, the prophet is not to be listened to. And uh, that's from the uh, heroic virtues that was written. If you guys want to Google that heroic virtues, that's how we Christians look at prophecies because we have to be you know, very careful. We can't just believe everything and and some there's a difference between public and and private so just to keep that in mind from from the faith working out from the faith part so hector takes achilles's armor uh 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 he took his armor that's that's a no go that's not good uh but in book 17 uh zeus says to achilles's immortal horses this is this is after uh his best friend his dearest friend is dead And this is the turning point of the story. This is what gets Achilles back in the game. So he is very distraught. And but 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 uh, I didn't think we mentioned in in the first episode. But Achilles does have these immortal horses. Yeah, horses. I'm sorry. He does have these immortal horses. Well, so it was given to um, uh, Peleus, and so he gives them to Achilles. So that that's kind of interesting. Uh, that a human has these immortal horses. And interesting enough, again, in book 17, Zeus says to Achilles' horses, he's talking to the horses, he says, quote, there's nothing more wretched than humans. And he goes on to explain why. But he kind of says, why did we give you to the mortals? Speaking of the horses, Zeus is like saying, why do we do this? Gods don't die. Animals die, but they don't know that they must die or will die. Whereas humans must die, and we know that they must die. That is very interesting if you think about that. In essence, in this book, there's three. The gods who who don't die, the animals who die but don't know that they do die, and then the humans who do die and know that they must die. Imagine, that, and that's what we deal with as humans. We contemplate our death. We contemplate. There's a great mystery, a great awareness of the story to pull that human theme out. And we can draw from that. But Zeus is wrong and right at the same time because that gives us courage, the humans. That gives us virtues, the humans. That gives us Time and Kleos, the humans. So Zeus is right and wrong, but he does tell the immortal horses that uh, why did we give you to immortal? We're, we're, they're pretty much saying that the immortal horses are way greater than mere mortal humans. Very interesting that he says that. And we know from our faith that we will live eternal lives. Not in this life, obviously, but we do know that we have something uh, great to look forward to. And that's something that we can trust in our Lord and Savior. Now, as we said, uh, Petrolicus' death is a crucial turning point in the Iliad. Because from now on, Achilles no longer has the rage that he has for Agamemnon. It's a loss. Now his anger has turned to Hector, getting revenge for his friend. And that's all he's looking for is the pursuit of Hector. That is the motivation for the rest of the Iliad. Achilles' reaction to his death is overwhelming with grief and determined vengeance against Hector. Thetis comes to mourn with him, his goddess mother. But he doesn't realize that that will lead to his death. 
But it doesn't matter because he accepts it, finally choosing his faith to follow. When his mother earlier in the books warned him, if you were to go after Hector, he would die. But if you were not, if you were to return home, he would live a very long life. Remember, we talked about that earlier. So Thetis goes to the blacksmith god who makes a new armor for Achilles. And it is a glorious one. Most notably, the shield, which has been like etched with art and pictures of the entire cosmos and stars and all this beautiful artwork. Also, two cities one at war and the other at peace. So imagine this Michelangelo S beautiful painting on the shield of Achilles and his new armor. Just got like getting some new J's or something like that. Sporting looking fly. He's looking great now. So he returns to battle, finally motivated. He did do like a reconciliation with Agamemnon. Remember, he, he turned to that. He's like, yes, whatever. You want to promise me all what you're going to give me? Fine. I don't care. I just want Hector. I want my revenge on the Trojans. And that's where it, where, where it comes down to. And he gets a message from the gods. Okay, Iris get, comes with a message from Hera telling Achilles to show himself to the Trojans. To remember, they're battling for the body of Patroclus. They're battling for his body. So to show himself, no armor. He doesn't need none of that. Why? Because he's going to have a flame cap crown on him by the gods descending that on him, giving them that image to the Trojans, striking fears by them and shouts aloud with Athena shouting with him. Imagine him, the sun going down. Imagine you're there scared after a long battle. You see Achilles, you hear his roar, you hear his shouts, you see a flame cap on him. You see the sun descending right behind him. Of course, the Trojans are going to panic. They're going to get out of there. Finally, the Iliad's longest day ends when the sun sets behind great swift-footed Achilles. This scene is very, very iconic in all literature history. One of the most recognizable scenes from the Iliad, along with all the other ones that we talked about. Achilles is portrayed here as pretty much being dead man walking. He's like that because when he dies, it is almost like he dies too. His dearest friend dies and that kills Achilles. He withdraws from the world. He doesn't want to eat. He doesn't want to sleep. He doesn't want to do anything. Thetis' actions also indicate that she is also suffering and mourning with him too. In uh, the Greek culture, one of the images of a mourning, per- mourning the dead was when the woman is behind the man with her hands on his head and he's laying down. And it's one of the scenes that shows him weeping. And that's what his mother's doing, portraying him as already a dead man because of his faith, but also because he withdraws from the world. He doesn't accept death. He doesn't. He rejects it. He outright rejects that death. He is like, Douse with fire image all over him. He is that force of nature unstoppable. He returns to the battle and he will kill anyone that stands in his way. It doesn't mean, it, does, it doesn't matter anything. And between books 19 and 22, Achilles is actually the only mortal to take any life. So he is like death personified. Even killing people when they surrender, he kills without pity. He is showing no mercy. He is unstoppable and he carries that beautiful shield with him, that beautiful armor. You see, it's like his the divine side coming out from his mother, unstoppable, and his mortal side. He is like a superhuman now. He is so deep in his rage and in his vengeance that death itself can't even hold him back. He can't reconcile himself to his dearest friend's death. He can't. He will not even, he refuses to hold a funeral for Patroclus. And even you see the horse, the one that we talked about earlier, his immortal horses, even they weep. All he could think about is Hector. That's the only thing that's on his mind. But we know in our faith that our bodies, we're not just souls, we're also bodies. And we're going to be resurrected at the end of time. But in the Greek culture, even they understood that I have to enter the underworld. They can't be defiled. There's certain things that they have to follow for them to enter Hades. Uh, the underworld, and we're going to talk about that really soon coming up. Because Achilles and Hector are the most, arguably the most character, um, and the most important characters in the Iliad. Now they're on a path to each other, which they are pretty much the polar opposite. Hector is very sympathetic, very recognizable human, very relatable. He's a family man. He's a father. He's a son. He's a brother. He's all of these things. He, the, the people love him in Troy. In Troy, they love him. 
He is in the community, very much deep in the community. He loves the people. The people love him. Achilles, he doesn't. He has a, a goddess's mo- a mother. He's not really there with his dad. He doesn't really have a lot of friends except one of his, his dearest friend that died. He's not really in the community. He's not. He's unmarried. He's very much cut off from society, and he's also like half god. So very kind of hard to relate to him. The two sides. Achilles and Hector, how different they are towards each other. Achilles knows kind of can sense a future because of his goddess mother kind of told him that is told him what his outcome will be. Hector hopes that Troy will stand, but deep down he realizes that it's it, it might be the fate of Troy to fall down. So they have different motivations to fight. Hector doesn't even want to fight. They don't, but they have to protect Troy. That's what he's really fighting for to defend his city, where Achilles is uh, motivated by rage and anger and he's on this quest and they're on foreign land remember that but Hector he accepts this he accepts the human condition even if he dies so he knows that he must confront Achilles he must so he goes out and he finally decides to fight him but then at the last minute he thinks about retreating back and forth back should I or shouldn't I He's overwhelmed by fear and he runs from Achilles. So then this foot race continues. So you see Hector running around the entire city that once was a peaceful city where people, the community lived out in the in the world. But now he's being caught in this nightmare, this little, like a nightmare when you're trying to run from something and you can't. Achilles is described as, as being superhuman at this time. He's being... He is unstoppable. He's like the lords of Lord of Battles. So finally, Hector stops running. He proposes Achilles to promise each other the safe return of their body, but Achilles refuses. He refuses, and this is what we're talking about. When they defile his body, the Greeks can't enter the underworld. Even Patroclus, his ghost, later comes to to Achilles and tells him, "Please bury my body so I can enter Hades, so I can enter the underworld." We know that as in our faith. Our bodies are very important. That's why we can do a bodily cremation, but it's very, very specific and we have to have certain qualifications, uh, you know, certain permissions. And but usually the norm is that we get buried, uh, that we don't do cremation and we have our bodies. Why? Because our bodies are very special. Remember, we're not just spirit. Christianity, we're not just about a spirit. We're also we're also about our bodies, our physical bodies, because we came from the ground and we will go back into the ground. So Christianity really puts an emphasis on the body. The body is a temple. So in the Greek culture, uh, if their bodies aren't properly buried and defiled, they can't enter e- either. So when Achilles refuses to make that promise, very devastating. Imagine the fear. Imagine the disappointment. Hector's wounded, and then when he's wounded, he begs Achilles not to defile his body. Achilles is just brutal, unmerciful, showing him, treating him like a dog, almost like a dog begging for his life. Achilles sees him as that, an animal. That's what in his eyes. And he kills Hector, the great Hector, falls, Prince of Troy, dead. Imagine the fighting. They fought so hard with each other. These are the two great warriors, blade hitting blade, iron in hot, hitting iron fatigue sets in blood sweat one-on-one it's like michael jordan versus another great one-on-one going at it but ultimately michael's gonna win and he defiles his body in front of the whole city of troy priam and his mother watch on andromache faints at the sight at the sight of imagine seeing that she just faints at that sight the defilement is serious it prevents hector his soul from entering the underworld by doing this and the famous scene where he takes the rope and he drags the prince of troy around he just defiles his body and drags him behind achilles's chariot so after hector is dead achilles still cannot reconcile himself to his dearest friend's death. Even the ghost, like I said, appear to Achilles and ask him, please bury him. Bury me, he says, so he can pass into the underworld. Achilles finally gives in because of the ghost's request and holds a big, huge funeral for Patroclus. There's feasts, there's games, there's all of this stuff, a big elaborate festival. But he still doesn't want to take a bath. He still doesn't want to eat. He's dragging Hector's corpse around Patroclus' tombs, continuing to defile his body. Even the gods look in and must intervene. They have to intervene. Apollo addresses the other gods and says, you know what, it's time to do something about this, to give Hector's body back to his family. And even Zeus agrees. And Thetis speaks to Achilles 
and they urge Priam to go to Achilles and ask for ransom for Hector's body. That is informs Achilles that this is the will of Zeus. And we talked about this theme about the will of the gods. Achilles finally accepts with indifference. Iris takes Zeus' message to Priam. And despite Priam's wife, tell her he, he, of course she doesn't want him to go. She doesn't want to lose her husband. She lost so many other people. He still goes. He decides to go and offers ransom for Hector's body. So Priam prays to Zeus for a successful and safe return. And Zeus gives him that. He gives him that, sends Hermes to guide Priam to Achilles' tent. Uh, the other Greeks are really aren't aware of that in the campsites. So Hermes in disguise we see the gods interfering again, using help. Priam is there finally with the help of Hermes, gets there to Achilles' tent, and he asks for Hector's body. He asks for Achilles to have pity on him and return Hector's body and kisses Achilles' hand. This is a huge sign, a huge sign of mercy, of showing somebody that you want forgiveness or mercy. You want. He's bending the knee pretty much, kisses Achilles' hands, and his reaction is like an, a big weight, an epiphany. Something strikes him. He is struck with wonder. He is struck with compassion, and he's struck with grief for Priam's request, and finally, Something breaks and agrees to return Hector's body. The two enemies, they cry together. They weep together. Priam, of course, for Hector and Achilles for his son. And Achilles breaks down and finally, slowly, his humanity returns and comforts Priam. And he knows that the gods are over them. And the gods know that they have faith and fate and destiny. And they're just human beings who must just do whatever the will of the gods are. So remember, they are still enemies, though. They are still, they're not going to uh, put down their arms forever, but for right now, they have compassion for each other. Even Achilles orders the other slave women that he has to wash Hector's body, because remember, the defilement, and he doesn't want his father to see his body like that. Even Achilles himself, he carries Hector's body to Priam's wagon. This encounter with him really touched, it really gives him the sense of, of, of morality, a sense of mortality, and finally gets him to accept death, accept the human condition, the big theme in the Iliad, accepting the human condition. So he takes the body to the wagon, and Achilles and Priam, they share a meal. They share a meal together, and they, they recall a story about another person where all 12 of her children had been killed, but yet she still persists and she still accepts it and she still moves on. And Achilles is reminded of this story that even his mother Thetis have been trying to tell Achilles about life does go on. It is not the end. Life must go on. And seeing his enemy's grief moves Achilles and rec recognizes that he too himself must accept death. And you see it in the story, in the weeping, the way he washes the body, the carrying of Hector's the, the compassion he shows to Priam. They have this glorious feast and they eat and they promise a truce after they have their di dinner. Achilles promises a truce of 11 days so the Trojans could have Hector's body give him a proper burial so he can finally enter the underworld. And the last image we see of Achilles is Achilles in his tent with Briseis. There's no mention of his death. Remember, a lot of people think in the Iliad, no, the Trojan horse is not in the Iliad, the Achilles, remember getting shot with the arrow from his Achilles heels, that is not shown in the Iliad either. There's a bunch of things that people think uh, that are in the Iliad, they're actually not. So that is the last time we see of Achilles. Now he is finally back in humanity. He's finally accepted the human condition and now he can meet his fate and die, which again is not shown. Priam, with grief still in his heart, but gratitude that he has a son back. He returns to Troy with his body. And the Iliad will end on Hector's funeral. Andromache, his wife, Hector's wife, he even Helen, they weep over Hector's body. Even Helen, who he had treated her so nice, so graciously, and she is so well accepting of that and, and appreciated of that. She really appreciates that, Helen, who for herself feels like she is the cause of all this bloodshed, this war. And I love the last line of the Iliad is, So they buried Hector, tamer of horses. And the book ends. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful book. 
There's so much stuff that we could get into. We could have done another hour podcast. We could have done another two hour podcast. But we really see the themes of forgiveness, of showing mercy. Really, I love the mercy part in that. That is what finally breaks is the mercy. Our faith teaches us a lot that we must forgive each other, right? Forgive us our sins. We must forgive people who have sinned against us. That is another theme about the Iliad showing what can finally get to the swift-footed Achilles. What can finally break through him to bring him back from his from not accepting the death, not accepting the human condition because we are mortal. It's a beautiful story. This is why it's one of the top Western canon books of all time in the great canon of Western civilization. We've seen movies, we've seen shows, we've seen comic books, we've seen references and music and movie and literature all over the place from the Iliad, pulled from everywhere, many throughout the entire world. We discussed our faith throughout in these two episodes. Also, fate, will of the gods, war, justice, courage, death, mercy, acceptance of death, glory, honor are just some of the themes and takeaways from a literature study standpoint. The Iliad is deeply integrated in our Western culture. Beautiful book. It's a must read. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Thanks for joining me, your genuflexer, Roger. Please come back every week to work out with Faith, Reason, and Geekdom podcast. Godspeed.